Alrighty, welcome back, everyone. Uh, today, I'm joined by Professor Ryan Shenvey at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California. I never know how to pronounce that that area, but it's north of San Diego. Um, but very excited today. Um, he's a professor of chemistry, as I mentioned at Scripps, but um, you know does a lot of research within you know natural product synthesis and you know how we can begin to think about the chemical space of natural products um, and how to develop those types of uh, compounds. Um, so I'm very excited to to talk about that today. I guess before we we get into all that, though, definitely start with a little bit about your background. Um, I was going through a little bit, um, and uh, I actually didn't know you're from Wilmington, Delaware. And so I actually grew up in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, and I went to school at to Widener University. So very familiar with the oh, fantastic, yeah, very just down familiar. The road where I grew yeah. up. I uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, Delaware has no sales tax, so. When I turned 21 and my friends and I would go down to Delaware to pick up all of our alcohol runs. So it's very, very nice down there. Um, and, and no sales tax in Delaware. Uh, but Wilmington, I would say unbeknownst to a lot of like people is actually like huge oil and gas, but also pharma. So at least I would say Delaware in general, like um, Delaware and really, I guess the Northeast in general, you think about like New Jersey and too uh, for pharmaceuticals. But in any case, I thought that was really interesting that you kind of grew up in the, the Northeast um, uh, and Wilmington specifically. Um, now, growing up, did you have like any you know particular interest in STEM or you know what were kind of some of your hobbies and activities kind of going up to like middle school, high school before um, going to college? Yeah, good question. I did not start out with a strong science trajectory. That's not what I imagined doing with my life. Uh, I did not imagine ending up in La Jolla, California, doing scientific research. You said it correctly, by the way. Uh, if you need a good pronunciation tip, I think it's in a, be uh, a Beach Boys song. I think it's really? Surfing USA. They <laughs> did a nice shout out to La Jolla, California. So uh, it can it will throw you when you read it, of course, because it's Spanish, but you hit it well. And you're right. Uh, Wilmington, Delaware is a real hub also for chemistry. So the reason that I was born there and grew up there is that my dad actually is also a chemist mm. and he was able to secure a position at what at the time was the very prestigious experimental station of DuPont in Wilmington, Delaware. And some people say you can think of it as sort of like the Bell Labs of chemistry. It was a place where obviously there was a strong industrial connection, but at the same time, had a focus on fundamental chemistry research, which you often don't find in other places today. So in fact, if you look at some of the people that were at the experimental station at the time, many of them have actually ended up in academia and started their own independent fundamental science research careers. Uh, Tom Baker is one of them. He's in organometallic and inorganic chemistry. Uh, TV Rajambabu at Ohio State has been, had a wonderful career in organometallics and synthetic chemistry. Uh, he's actually a, a, now a good uh, friend and colleague of mine, I think of it, I think of him as so uh, interesting how you can sort of grow up and know people from very different perspective. Uh, when I was growing up in Wilmington, I was actually not so interested in science and chemistry. I was much Fair. more interested in, in music and art. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, in, in pop culture, you get the idea that somehow those are diametrically opposed. And they're really not. I mean, they're extensions of human creativity and a search for beauty and for truth. So yeah. in many ways, there's a lot of overlap between art and science. Yeah, those are some great points. I, uh, when, I, when, I, when I did my undergrad at Widener, they'd oftentimes say, and I didn't appreciate it at the time because I was like, you know, I don't know, 19, 20. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of great, fundamental organometallic research came out of DuPont um, like for a long period of time. And then they, and which is kind of hard to find nowadays. I don't know. I mean, maybe you can speak on this more than I can, but it seems like a lot of industry nowadays is not particularly focused on the fundamentals of chemistry. I don't know. Perhaps that's, that's ill-spoken, but um, yeah, I mean, DuPont was really leading the charge in uh, like really fundamental chemistry um, for years um, before many of those, people got snatched up by, by academia, I would say, but I don't know if that's ill-spoken yeah, or I don't to make know. A, no, no, it, it, it's hard to make a broad stroke statement across yeah. all of chemistry and all of industry, because of that's course fair. this is an extremely diverse group of 
of scientists. And you will still find um, a lot of fundamental science, uh, fundamental chemistry that takes place in the industry. But maybe what I could say is that my impression is, is that it's not as concentrated as and as concerted as it was at DuPont at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a fair statement. Um, now, so you, you had mentioned you, you kind of uh, were more so interested, in, let's say, in uh, the arts um, and music rather than than STEM fields growing up. So when you know what particular influences kind of um, in, in both those aspects or genres kind of influence you the most um, kind of growing up then? Yeah, I guess there were probably two main strains that found their way uh, in my interest in art music into the science that I do now. Hmm. So when I was growing up, the music I was I say most drawn to was jazz. I had this a fantastic saxophone teacher named Dave Schiff. He's kind of a legend, actually, in the Wilmington area. His father, <laughs> Hal Schiff, uh, was really a um, instrumental, no pun intended, in bringing high class music education to the Wilmington area. He was a band leader, well known in his own right, as as his son Dave was, and Dave was um, a private saxophone teacher that was also uh, such a great role model for education and uh, also humility and just the way he interacted with people was wonderful. Uh, and the, the music of jazz really influenced me in how I think about chemistry. Mm. We can maybe touch on that later, but it's this idea of um, both a creative expression, but also taking inspiration from a lot of different areas even down to the granular detail of individual licks, let's say, that you would then weave together into an you know, improvis improvisational solo, you can think of that sort of as individual chemical reactions that you put together into a complex synthesis. Mm -hmm. And there are numerable ways in which you can put those together, but maybe one way is better than another way. One way is more elegant a solution to the problem than another. Yeah. And so in that way, I think there's a lot of similarities between how you go about designing synthesis and how you go about crafting a solo in jazz. Uh, another inspiration for me was art. I really always loved to draw. Um, one of my favorite artists was Michelangelo. Okay, probably mm. not alone in that. Uh, but for me, based the answer. important part. What's that? It's a based answer. Based. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the important part of that aspect was that, you know, if when you're in chemistry, you know that a lot of this takes place with pen and paper. You're sketching out ideas. You're trying to visualize things in your head, thinking about them in three dimensions, but then expressing them in two dimensions and be able to think and problem solve visually is very important in chemistry. It's kind of the language of chemistry that we use. And for, for me, that's very much rooted in my interest in art when I was growing up. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely we'll definitely come back to that, Jess. Because um, I've, from what I people that are, um, you know, my col I'd say my colleagues, I guess, is that they're all kind of uh, musically inclined. Like I've actually never played an instrument, but I could see I can appreciate it now and respect it now that maybe having a background in like kind of music um, can actually in some ways help your, you know, it can help you, you know, the way you think about. I would say chemistry specifically because of kind of what we're in, but um, it definitely is something to be said about that. Um, so we'll definitely return to that later on when we talk about your research. Um, now, so, but kind of coming out of, you know, high school, you went to uh, Penn, Penn State University um, and you actually did mm -hmm. undergraduate research with uh, Professor Raymond Funk, um, who even I've heard of, um, like, like I've seen his name tossed around a lot um, through my time at Widener. Uh, but now, did you enter PSU as a, you know, kind of a, let's say more on the liberal arts, not liberal arts, but like a arts and uh, music side or, um, you know, how did you shift to chemistry, let's say? Yeah, I started out actually in the pre-med major when I had to declare a major. And to be honest, it was not a very inspired choice. Uh, I, you know, in the back <laughs> of my mind, I thought, well, I like some kind of fancy job where I can have a secure financial future. Fair. You know, 
sort of AKA make a lot of money. That That is like the worst, that's the worst possible motivation to go into anything, especially medicine when it's about caring for others, not taking care of yourself. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot so, of uh, people at 17 and 18 think that way, which I don't know really yeah, how to fix know, that, yeah, but. Point. <laughs> I mean, it was an, it was it was an immature kind of uh, decision that fortunately I, I snapped out of quickly. And the good thing was that a lot of the classes that I had to take as prerequisites for the pre-med major then ended up overlapping when I decided I wanted to go into chemistry. Mm. Uh, and, and that was based actually on really two classes that I ended up taking simultaneously. Uh, one of them was Ray Funk's organic chemistry class. Ray had not only a charisma in the way he taught, but also this incredibly piercing intellect and the ability to communicate that to students, which I found um, captivating and really un unparalleled in any other classes that I took. And already at the time, I could sort of see how the visual problem solving, the nature of organic chemistry really, really fit with the way I thought and what my interests and talents were. So I ended up really enjoying that class. At the same time, I was taking a class in discrete math taught by a professor named David Sibley. And it was similar in some ways to jazz. I remember describing to a friend of mine who actually went into a career in music. He went to Berkeley College of Music, just an incredibly musician, uh, way better than, than I could ever achieve. And I remember having a conversation with him about the similarities in the classes I was taking in jazz. And in mathematics, similar to the way that you put together an elegant solution for a complex molecule, you can put together a mathematical proof where you take these axioms of mathematics and you, you know, see how they can build on one another to answer a question or solve a problem that maybe had previously not been answered. Hmm. And those two classes put together with my interest in, in art and music growing up really pushed me into thinking about a career in in chemistry and specifically organic chemistry. Yeah, those are definitely important points, especially like, I mean, I've never taken discrete math because I was always in the, like, I, my undergrad was like chemical engineering, so I never had to take discrete math. I was always kind of in the calculus and stuff like that. But, you know, I definitely, mm -hmm. like like we we're kind of talking about, I mean, kind of definitely grew an appreciation for math and how you can really begin to, uh, you just, you put it great. It's that you really can, how you think about these complex problems and you come to like come to a solution. Just on the organic chemistry, um, I think that's what you said about Professor Funk is, is interesting because I, I, had a, I assume you were in like a 300 person course when you were taking organic. I mean, PSU is a pretty good big school. So were you in like a huge class? Yeah, it is a big school. So yeah, so the, the first year classes I took in general chemistry were these huge classes. Okay. I was lucky enough to secure a position in a small honors class in organic chemistry. Okay. So I would say the class size was maybe on the order of 30 or 40. Okay. Which yep. for Penn State is, is microscopic. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and that was nice because uh, we, I can't say that we had any more interaction on a regular basis with uh, Professor Funk than in the larger classes. But it mm. definitely, I mean, he was, it was a smaller room. He was communicating with us and it felt like individually. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I was just going to say, like, if it were the 300 person class, I'd be like for him to kind of uh, speak to you in that charisma and, and, and all the things I'd say, it must be a real testament then to his personality. And maybe that's still true for the oh. 40 person class, but I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, no, oh, no, man. no, that's, that's That'd be crazy. Ray. That's Ray. Ray. Ray could capture an audience of three or 3,000. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, so I guess then when you took that class, that kind of, well, both those classes, right? So discrete math and organic, that kind of, I guess, put you on this path towards to where you are now in some ways, but um, how did you uh, get involved with like undergraduate research? Was that some he was looking for students or did you like were just interested by his own research and asked him or how did that transpire? Yeah, that was um, a little initiative on my part, a lot of help from others and just a lot of dumb luck. So when I, goes. Started, <laughs> yeah, when, when I started, yeah, I started at Penn uh, I was a bit of an odd duck at Penn State. So I just ended up listening to an episode of This American Life over the summer. And the title of the episode is uh, America's Number One Drinking School. And guess what the subject of the episode was? It was an entire yeah. episode about Penn State. And I think that 
culture has diminished a little bit over time. But when I went there, it was very much in full swing. Yeah. People, you know, I've grown up a lot over time. And, uh, you know, as you pointed out, my decision making process was a little immature and I was 17, 18 years old. But even at the time, that whole partying, drinking culture, that was just not me. Yeah, it's not me now. And I was such an odd duck at Penn State. And I, I just felt like I didn't fit in and I had a hard time making friends. And I found myself after classes, going back to my dorm room and playing video games for like hours. And that is like the mm. worst use of one's time that I could possibly imagine. That, I, mean, I love video games, don't get me wrong. But the amount of time that I could have been investing myself into uh, better pursuits was wasted. So right. I ended up trying to get a job first at the art museum because I liked art. So it was sort of a quiet place, felt like I could study, do my homework, maybe sketch from the masters, right? They had already filled up their positions. So then I tried to the library, same kind of idea, nice quiet place, stay, keep myself out of trouble, do my homework. Right. They had filled up all their spots. Uh, but a guy in my dorm had... Uh, research position. He, had, he was a junior at the time, and he was exploring undergraduate research in a uh, protein biophysics lab. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, you know, you, sh you should check it out. And I just happened to, I mean, this totally coincidence, because my dad was a chemist, we had copies of like CNE News, Scientific American floating around the house. And, you know, it was not necessarily in my interest, but from time to time, I'd see a cover article or I'd pick it up and look at the pictures and read the captions, you know. And I was familiar with the protein folding problem. Right. And, I mean, this is interesting because now, 2023 or 2022, we have AlphaFold. And that has largely, using machine learning, solved this problem of predicting a structure, a three-dimensional quaternary structure from primary, the primary amino acid sequence. That didn't exist at the time. And, and still, you know, there's a lot of questions about how a protein reaches its um, native fold based on its primary sequence. This is not, mm. even though alpha fold can predict it, how it actually reaches that low energy or sometimes not low energy structure is not uh, fully known. So I was kind of familiar with this problem. So, and I wanted to find a way to use my time and, you know, get a job after class. So I went and spoke with the professor, John Desjardins, again, a wonderful guy. I think he's still, I think he's at Zencore now, uh, again, mm. doing protein biophysics, uh, and he allowed me to have a research position in his lab as a freshman. And, wow. you know, I'm so grateful that because in many ways, that was what set me on the course to where I am today. And, and at the time, it was, you know, simple work, things like washing glassware, right. uh, you know, putting things in the autoclave. Uh, but eventually, as I stuck around and stuck it out and showed that I was willing to work hard, which is probably the, the, the number one the number one thing that will lead to success in science is, is I mean, you need to have some kind of in, innate intelligence, sure, but really it's hard work that in, in this career or anything else will uh, yes. lead to success. So I started getting more and more responsibilities and started eventually doing, uh, you know, calcium titrations and measuring UV vis and um, circular dichroism. So again, I wasn't sort of an independent scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but I was at least getting familiar with the pace of research, what it looks like, basic laboratory technique. And at the time that I took these classes in discrete math and organic chemistry and sort of found uh, my passion in organic chemistry, I was at least familiar with what it was like to be in a research lab. Yeah. And actually, uh, John Desjardins, to his credit, went and spoke with Ray and said, you know, hey, if this person's interested in your lab, you should give him a chance. He works hard. So. Mm. Uh, I'm really grateful for John for putting in a good word for me with Ray and uh, the TA, um, the TA for Ray's class also, I think, suggested that I might want to look into research with Ray's lab if I was enjoying the class so much, which you knew, knew I was. So mm -hmm. between those two, they put in a good word for me and I found my way into Ray's lab. Yeah, that's, that's, that's incredible. I mean, if anything else, I mean, you know, working hard, definitely, you know, your kindness, your generosity and working hard really kind of bring you the furthest in any aspects of life, I would argue. Um, but mm -hmm. it just, yeah, I think uh, for a lot of students out there, like I, 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 I love video games as well. Like I, um, you know, I, I could sit there and play like four or five hours straight without even 
like with, with no with no problem at all. And I find a lot of students, you know, obviously like a lot of male students nowadays going to college and they spend like they go to classes and go back to dorms to play four or five hours of video games. I'm not saying that video games are not a good, uh, let's say, leeway or leisure activity, but you know, four or five hours. I mean, I, you know, I think you, unless you're going to be streaming full time, unless you're streaming and maybe you become a, a streamer, like I just don't really see. It's definitely better efficient ways to use your time. Um, so get out there a little bit and uh, you know see see what's interesting you and and uh, you know whatever. You know, it doesn't have to be chemistry, obviously, like if, you know, just whatever interests you, like get out there and talk to some professors because, I mean, like an opportunity like that where you were just like, even just like cleaning glassware or like just autoclaves, like simple things, you know, you, you show up every day and just lead, you know, um, you just tug on that a little bit and you know how far you can get. But that's really, that's really cool. So you join Professor uh, Funk's lab, um, given this opportunity. Again, I mean, I guess you would have been a sophomore at this time or junior maybe? Kind of early on. Let me see. I, uh, let, let me think about that. Um, I think I started in Ray's lab at the beginning of my junior year. Okay. So I took mm-hmm. his class the spring semester of my sophomore year, and mm-hmm. I did a little industry internship in in the summer between my sophomore and junior years. Yep. So okay. There you go. Okay. So then, kind of uh, the latter years. Um, and you know, what were you doing in in Professor Funk's lab, like? to kind of put you down this research path. Yeah, so he had been working on a general approach to um, a particular, well, frame this a little bit. So several years before I joined his lab, his group had discovered this dioxinone uh, retro four plus two deals alter cycle addition that would unmask acrolein motifs, which if you're familiar with uh, synthetic chemistry, a little bit hard to carry through a sequence. It's kind of like, you know, people will maybe debate me on this, but I think organic chemistry is a lot like cooking, right? So uh, when you're cooking, you're carrying, you know, your recipe through multiple steps of mixing the dries and the wet ingredients, maybe baking, then doing icing, etc. You know, acrolein is just fundamentally not stable. Imagine, you know, having to carry an entire uncooked egg shell and all through a recipe without breaking it, right? You've got to mix around it. You've got to beat the ingredients. You've got to mix the wet and the dry. And all the whole time, you've got this hard, fragile, raw egg, and you can't break it. <clears throat> so, and acrylate is a little bit like that. It's um, very reactive at, at carbon, at two, two of the carbon positions. I had to look up the structure. Uh, I was like, no, I had to, I had quickly looked. I just like quickly looked up the structure, and I was like, that seems like a disaster to try and like carry through that great electrophile yeah, so or anything. In, <laughs> yeah. So in general, in, in general, what you want to do is some somehow reveal it at the end. And Ray's lab had uh, developed a series of methods uh, or strategies to carry through this masked form or protected form of the acrolein and then unmask it through mild thermal or Lewis acid catalyzed conditions so that you could either use it in the subsequent steps or potentially it was actually in your product material. Mm -hmm. So he started me on a small project to use those, that unmasking technique in a Fisher indole synthesis. And, you know, ultimately I think the, project would have been um, a nice orglet or tetlet for an undergraduate. But yep. at the time, I think he saw that I was willing to put in the hard work and maybe could achieve something, um, you know, of a higher tier. So he actually put me on a natural product synthesis by oh, myself wow. as an undergraduate, which <laughs> I think at the time I didn't appreciate the significance of uh, that. That's a, that's a high, that's a large ask. That's a big project to give to an undergraduate student. But, you know, to his credit, he had a good design that I think was reasonable for an undergraduate to reduce to practice. And it involved the synthesis of uh, a couple of natural products that were related, Autolione A and B. Okay. And uh, there are a couple of syntheses now that have emerged. My my favorite approach, actually, I don't know that it's been published, but I saw, uh, I think it's in the thesis work from a student from Tom Hoy's group. Okay. And, you know, my work actually wasn't published. We never finished the natural product, although we had a nice approach. But that really taught me about both the beauty and the difficulty of natural product synthesis. And I was mm-hmm. kind of hooked. I feel like that's 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 fantastic, too, because, like, as an undergrad, obviously, like, you're there's, like, no pressure, basically. Like, you're just there, like, having fun. Um, and at least for undergrad research, it's it's 
I mean, I guess like many things in life, it's, it's, you get out of it what you put into it, but there's no pressure, obviously, to like finish it or whatever. So it must have been super fun and relieving just to kind of get in the lab and try and make this molecule. Um, I also find it really interesting. Yeah, it, like, it, was, it, was, it was fun. I, I do feel like there was a lot of pressure and it wasn't okay. from Ray per se, but in some ways, you know, your project gives itself the own, its own pressure. And, yes. you know, when one of the, one of the nice things about natural product synthesis is there is a clear goal. And mm. that's not always true in all areas of chemistry research. If you're doing, you know, mechanistic interrogation, there is no end to that. In fact, <laughs> one of my not. favorite books, <laughs> I, think a I think a student has uh, this book, but it's uh, Barry Carpenter's Determination of Organic Reaction Mechanisms. And he points out in the introduction, you can't stop doing a mechanistic study. There's always another question you can ask. So frequently you publish a paper when the student needs to graduate, when you think yep. you've had like a complete enough story to tell, or you run out of money or you run out of patience, <laughs> right? Uh, it's true. And, and it, similarly true. in methodology, it's like how many scope entries do you include? Do you, do you right. go into mechanism? Do you expand the method for different coupling partners? There's no clear answer to that. For natural product synthesis, at least traditionally, it's nice because it's packaged together. This is what we want to make. You either make it or you don't. Right. So I felt like there's a lot of pressure, actually, as an undergraduate, yeah. because that is the goal. And if you don't reach that goal, you're out of luck. And yeah. I ended up not reaching that goal. We had made a nice, nice model uh, due to actually the difficulty of a Grignard formation ever done that it can be a like bit of an art form especially when you're an undergraduate that is can be uh, difficult if you're not but, but it was but it was a great experience it was great training and i think actually the pressure was very good for me mm, okay yeah why do you why do you feel that way it was just like kind of helping you kind of focus or yeah there's this kind of there's this pressure. concept that actually a, a friend of mine who's a high school teacher introduced me to and is called you stress eu stress you okay. being the, the prefix um, from greek meaning good there's certainly a level of stress or a type of stress, which is unhealthy. And I think we're seeing that today, especially in adolescents and teenagers with the uh, you know, kind of artifice of social media, putting unhealthy standards out there that students are trying to reach or strive for, constant comparisons to people. There's a type of stress that is unhealthy, but there's a certain level of stress that actually can uh, push you to really achieve your potential. And I feel like having that goal set in front of me was for me very good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's some great points. Yeah. I think, uh, stress is, stress is a very interesting like concept because the way you frame your stress can kind of obviously can affect your mood. I mean, you can obviously have good and bad stress, but like even just the way you talk about things like, um, can significantly impact how you handle, you know, things in life. So yeah, I think that, I think that's, uh, really interesting point. Um, but coming out of, uh, PSU, um, or Penn state, you know, uh, then you wanted to, well, I guess pursue a graduate degree. Um, first, first question is then like, was that kind of a natural decision, uh, to go to graduate school? Um, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's difficult. Um, I think, in any decision-making process, it is natural and also good to get input from other people. Mm. And when I joined the, when I joined Ray Funk's lab, I had this great cohort of uh, graduate students around me that kind of helped orient me and calibrate me to the, um, the lay of the land in scientific research. Uh, you may actually know some of these names. So uh, Jim Fuchs is one of them. He's now a professor in the pharmacology department at Ohio State University. And okay. Tom Greshock, who has steadily moved up the ladder at uh, Merck, uh, was also one of the graduate students in Ray's lab. Uh, just a fantastic cohort of graduate students. And I, to <laughs> this day, I'm so grateful for them for putting up with me because, <laughs> you know, I was just a kid. What did I know? And I, I, I had my times where I was a little bit obnoxious, but they did help guide me as you know, to what, where research could lead and what careers in chemistry were like. And, yeah. you know, they, they suggested to me, Hey, you might want to look into a higher degree because that can put you on the path to then, um, 
reach you know upper echelons where you can then decide what you want to do with your career. In some ways, yeah. the lower you aim, the the harder it is to to make decisions. Well, right, let me put it this way: the lower you aim, the fewer doors are open. Yeah, yeah. If you it's aim high but you fail, then you know you'll at least you'll eventually equilibrate to the right location. Uh, right. I think Ray put it better is that it, it's um, it's much easier to move down than to move up. Yeah, very true. Yep. That was, uh, that's something that my, my advisor had said, because kind of coming towards senior year, I was doing like undergraduate research just like yourself. And I like, wasn't really ready to do industry. Like I just was like, mm, I, like, I'm just not really ready yet. And that's what he told me. He's like, yeah, well, PhDs in chemistry is, is, is paid for. Like you're, you're, um, you know, you get stipends or uh, whatever tuition paid for, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. And so, and lo and behold, I, you know, <laughs> went on to graduate school. So I actually didn't, I didn't know that, but there's a, there's a great point though. A lot of people that do like, let's say, uh, well, I, I can speak on like chemistry specifically. Like it is, if you just finish with a bachelor's of chemistry, that's fantastic, but it's hard to move up. Like if you enter an industry job, you know, whether that's the, you know, whatever you're doing, consulting or, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, oil and gas, it's hard to move up the chain. You know, it's like, they're going to be taken by people with PhDs or people that have the, like postdoc, postdoctoral research experience. It's just, that's just the bottom line. So, yeah. Yeah, and, so there, uh, there are definitely practical benefits from getting yeah. a PhD. But the other thing that I think it's important for anyone listening to understand is that it's also an opportunity for, um, well, as the name implies, higher education. And that just means fundamentally learning things you wouldn't otherwise learn, learning how to think in a way that you otherwise wouldn't learn to think. And so on the one hand, there is the practical side where it's an investment in your future that is a financial investment that is you could say a lifestyle investment in so insofar as you can then plot your own course easily if you have a higher a degree in higher education. But yeah. I would say more importantly, it's an investment in your growth as a person. It's yeah. an opportunity to uh, be guided by both your cohort, but other faculty members to um, think at a higher level. That's not to say, obviously, that you can't think at a high level without a higher education degree. Of course. Okay? But I think you know, for me anyway, it was the opportunity to be driven to that higher level of uh, research, of familiar familiarity with complex ideas, and to then start generating complex ideas as an right. independent scientist. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point as well. I, I, the financial stability, like after graduation with a PhD, is definitely like great. But I agree, though. I think I think something that's that's kind of lost and maybe not marketable for like attending graduate school is like actually the, the sheer number of like opportunities there are. So like in graduate school, I mean, you know, we, I mean, here at Houston, we have seminars once a week where a professor comes in talks about their research and oftentimes students go to lunch or dinner with them. So it's like, and that's just one opportunity, right? So like, you know, one, you're opening your networking, but also it's like, it's literally just free information. Like it's just an hour of just like, you're not even really doing much. All you got to do is you're just going to a seminar and it's just free information. And so, and obviously, obviously conferences, and then you have like, you know, you have huge ones like the ACS, but you also have like small ones like the Gordon Research Conferences. But, and so that are just unique opportunities that like, I, I would argue you simply really don't get uh, if you just finish at the undergraduate level. It's just the opportunities just aren't there. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I actually, I, uh, I benefited a lot from Professor Caro's lecture. He was just here, oh, right. I don't know, four weeks ago or something. Just gave an outstanding lecture, and I think typified what what the opportunities are in fundamental science research to really mm. start, you know, looking at um, looking at a difficult problem and thinking about it deeply and coming up with beautiful solutions and insights. I mean, that was it was from just a fundamental perspective one of the best seminars that we've had the uh, honor of hosting. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I know uh, when you. When you get our lab talking about polarizability, it's 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 very uh very fun time. Um, yeah, Tony and Justin on that, those projects have you know they put so many hours in that that computational study. But yeah, polarizability is a huge aspect of our lab, and you know we could talk days on that. Uh, <laughs> a really fundamental, like really cool aspect I think of catalysis and how to think about not not just sterics, but you know how mm -hmm. polarizable groups really can actually facilitate catalysis. Um, so. 
but yeah, that's, that's, that's really cool. I mean, yeah, like you said, I mean, you know, professors and once a week giving lectures for information that you just don't get unless you're, you know, a graduate student, but in any case, um, so, but you, you do go to Scripps. So, you know, you, you, you do your PhD at Scripps. Um, I mean, huge switch up from the Northeast in Pennsylvania. Uh, what kind of led you to go to uh, the, the Scripps Research Institute as a graduate student? Yeah, so one of the benefits of doing undergraduate research is that you get calibrated to um, the the current trends, what labs are doing, what kind of research, what labs are thought of as doing interesting research. And so I would talk to the graduate students and to Ray about if I was interested in graduate school, who would they recommend that, you know, I would I should work with, you know, who's who's doing really interesting research at the time. And this was 2002, 2003. And uh, Ray recommended I look into Eric Sorensen. So he was a reasonably young faculty member at Scripps. Hmm. He had just published a series of uh, beautiful total syntheses, uh, in particular on using the Steele's Alder Cascade to make a series of uh, polycyclic polyketides. And uh, Ray was really captivated by it. And Eric drew these nice parallels to the Stork Eschen Moser hypothesis for a polyene cyclization en route to the steroids. Mm-hmm. So I ended up, you know, putting him on a list of faculty members, and as a result, putting Scripps on a list of potential schools where I would I would like to study. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, I did. Th- so for listeners who are maybe not familiar with how this works, you'd apply to graduate school. Nowadays, I think most applications are. F- free. That wasn't the case at the time. I think there was a fee associated with each application. So I think you know, they kind of have to, I'm not sure they, they're still, they, they still cost a fee. I think, I, I think mine had a fee. Actually, I don't remember. That's a good question. Maybe it's state by yeah, state. I, I don't know. I don't some, remember. Some schools have dropped the fee because now with everything online, it doesn't really make sense. You don't have to do a lot of paperwork handling and mailing applications and things, but at the time, yes. uh, some applications were still mailed. Scripps have actually never had an application fee. So it's, uh, sorry to not be familiar with how it works now, but now being a Scripps as a faculty member, I just, I don't really know what other schools do. So, um, you know, I applied to several schools and the nice thing about applying to graduate school is if you're accepted, they bring you out for a visit and they pay your way. They put you up in a hotel. Uh, you get to meet faculty. They'll buy you lunch and dinner. So for me, this is this is a huge treat. I mean, it was a really big yeah, honor. Yeah, of course. Um, and of course, then if you apply to Scripps and you get accepted, you come out here and you stay in um, La Jolla, California, which is beautiful. I can show you actually the view hey, from my office it. right now. I don't know. This that's is awesome. uh, what I'm looking that at. Golf course? So that's a golf course in the Pacific Ocean, right just beyond it. Jeez. So this, this is a up, how, golf how course. far is the walk? How far is the walk to the ocean? Well, uh, I or is it kind of I mean, is it much if, further if than you I want imagined? To wander through the golf course and avoid the security. It's probably be I don't know, maybe ten minutes. But um, all right. Otherwise, I think the best route to get there is you just walk down the street, maybe about a mile and a half, and there's a state park called the Torrey Pines Reserve, and there are trails that uh, kind of lead you down the cliffs that separate where we are in the Torrey Pines Mesa from the beach. Must be a great walk. So, yeah, yeah. You also I'm have very to be jealous able, right now. I went, I'm not going to lie. Jealous. Straight through the golf course this way, and end, I'd end yeah. up on a nude beach. So I had to be a little bit <laughs> direction I took. Mostly old naked men. I didn't know there was um, illegal. In, I didn't know there was illegal in the United States. Actually, it kind of makes sense in California, I guess. Like very progressive there, but okay. It's California. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Um, but anyway, uh, so, La, Jolla, so La Jolla definitely I, captures you. At uh, uh, 21, Jolla, I'm sure. It, 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 definitely it was beautiful. Tour. It was one of the few California schools that I applied to. And I came out here to meet Eric Sorensen. It, it was a great visit. But I found out at the time that he had accepted a position at Princeton. It would be moving. Mm. So that was kind of a yep. shocker. And it, it totally uh, changed then my perspective on what graduate school I may end up in. But I was very lucky that... At the time, there was a new faculty member who was just starting. He, he actually wasn't on my schedule because I didn't know that he'd be starting his lab at the time. So I was able to secure um, kind of an unusual time, set early Saturday morning meeting before I had to fly back to school. 
Mm -hmm. And this was Phil Barron. And I ended up being one of his first graduate students in his lab. Wow. So uh, meeting with him was just, it it was, it was, it was, it was all of Ray's charisma and energy and intellect uh, kind of magnified 10 or a hundred fold. So I was hooked from the beginning. That's, that's really, uh, we're out of curiosity, did you cross paths with Professor Noah Burns at all? I think he's at Stanford. Yeah, now. yeah, was, yeah. Noah's okay, a good right. friend of mine. I was, uh, I was just at his wedding a couple of years ago. Oh wow, Vicks. okay. Because he, he was on my podcast a few months ago, but I just, I, I know that's a small world. Look at this, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. I, the more and more, the more and more, like I do these podcasts, the more and more I'm realizing how like actually small knit, like low key, like, <laughs> like I just see the same names over and over again. Um, I always find that super, super fascinating. For better or for worse, yeah, it's, small a, it's, it's a small world. For better or for worse, it yeah. is nice to see people all the time. But that also means that um, you know, if you have a bad interaction with someone, that will end yeah. up sticking around for a while. Yep. So be kind and be generous to everyone you meet. Um, but in any case, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm sure. You know, what, it's really unfortunate because when I when I was like looking at prospective like graduate schools, that's when COVID hit. So I unfortunately never got the experience of like flying out to wherever and then getting, you know, wined and dined by uh, the department. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, that's if, too bad. We had our fair share of Zoom interview weekends, which is not a lot of fun for yeah, anybody. Not fun for anyone. So if anything else, if you're if you're like, you know, a go getter or, you know, or you have interest in graduate school, just apply and just, like, you know, you'll be surprised. I mean, that wine and dine experience is super fun. Um, really getting to see professors kind of in a nonchalant kind of atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, is, is super unique and super, super fun. But in any case, yeah, so I'm sure La Jolla at, uh, you know, 2020, 20, you know, 21, 22 years old is, I mean, I'm sure that just captures you, but also the chemistry is just stellar. Let's, let's have it right too. That scripts, I mean, the chemistry is just fantastic. Um, you know, but so coming to graduate school, you know, what about, uh, professor Phil? Cause he was, I mean, as you mentioned, he was kind of a, I guess it would have been an assistant professor at the time. He just gotten hired. So you know, what were you working on as, as some of the first projects in, in the Baron lab? Yeah. I, so I remember, um, vividly Phil had a list of potential targets that he wanted to work on that he thought were, uh, significant. And the ones that I thought were the most compelling that I would like to make part of my PhD had already been taken by other mm. graduate students. I guess I, I got my name on the list a little too late. So I ended up working on a class that we termed the halohistophans because they were a combination of halogen atoms, uh, metabolized uh, histidine and tryptophan amino acids kind of put together in this odd motif. And I think if I knew what I know now, I would have chosen that as my first pick because they're so unusual compared Mm. to other metabolites you'll find in the literature. At the time, I thought they were boring which is a shocker, but at the same time, I was, I was not well calibrated. I had a lot of learning to do. And they also ended up being extremely difficult, which I also didn't anticipate. I was, you know, a little bit cocky and then combined with being (laughs) not a good combination. I thought I could bang these out in six months to a year. Well, you had some undergraduate research, you know, so you had some complex molecule synthesis riding high off that. Yeah. So I was a little overconfident and actually to my great benefit, (laughs) My first year of graduate school was a disaster. I mean, nothing worked. Everything failed. And I actually would say that that was the best experience that could have happened to me because Mm. sort of the opposite was true as an undergraduate. Everything sort of worked out. It was a smooth path. And I think it gave me a misconception about what research is actually like, which in many ways is 99% failure and 1% success. So that first year of graduate school was very helpful for me and kind of showed me where I needed to improve both in my experimental technique and the way I, you know, went went about uh, working in the laboratory, but also in the way I thought about chemistry and um, then how to guide a project from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Now, as you mentioned, I mean, yeah, graduate school, well, let's say the project you take on, I mean, you know, 90 some percent of the time it, it isn't work. I mean, you know, people have to remember that, like, we are on the cutting edge of, of science and chemistry. Like, this, this, this is supposed to be difficult. Um, 
and you have to work hard to to you know get some really good results. You know, what were some of the things that you either told yourself, or you know, if you had friends or family, or, or maybe even Professor Barron, uh, kind of told you to kind of keep going? Like, what were kind of the things that you kind of did day to day that kind of kept your I don't know if you had a positive attitude or just in general, or, you know, I'm sure there were some tough days, but like, you know, what kind of kept you going? Yeah. One thing I can certainly say um, is that Phil is incredibly, remains to this day, incredibly encouraging and is, yeah. has just this intuitive sense of knowing how to motivate people when they're feeling discouraged. And I remember walking to his office, you know, <laughs> uh, symbolically bloody and beaten and not knowing when my, na my last breath will be and him really just, you know, and making me enthusiastic about uh, continuing with the research and here are some milestones we can hit. Um, but the other side of that was ways in which I really needed to grow and mature. And I think part of that was I would have benefited from uh, slowing down and doing things the proper way rather than trying to push forward and get a result as quickly as possible, independent of my technique or of my experimental setup, or even you know stopping and reading the literature to understand how something worked. Mm. That's something that you know probably many people go through in graduate school. But if you have to face that self-realization. You have to be able to own up to your weaknesses, and then uh, find the the assets to address them. Right. So that, that was one thing. I mean, part of this is sort of um, looking at through rose colored, colored glasses. Like I know now what I lacked at the time more with more clarity than I knew then. Yeah. But I sort of came to this realization and, um, you know, forced myself to own up to these hard truths that I wasn't as awesome as I thought I would <laughs> be. And I, I, was, I wasn't going to be as successful as or successful at all if I didn't address some of these problems. Right. Now, some of these problems were these kind of like, like, let's say like techniques. So the way you're carrying out your, like practically like in the lab, in the fume hood, like just these techniques that you were kind of failing in or what kind of, I mean, I don't know if you re remember like specifically what, what was kind of holding you back, let's say. Uh, how much shop do you want to talk? Do you want me to like go into I'm the down. details of <laughs> I am absolutely down to do that. I think it'd be, I think it'd be insightful for some students, but I'm, I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy with yeah, whatever. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so some of the things will be familiar to you or your listeners. Um, for example, titrating your reagents. So mm. that you get a bottle of butyl lithium from Sigma Aldrich. Don't assume that it's 1.5 molar, but you know, you should titrate it and determine the concentration for yourself. If you get any reagent from any company, uh, you should, if, I mean, maybe you can do an exploratory reaction if it's not too precious material or too costly, but you shouldn't assume that it's pure and you should try to purify it. You know, for yeah. example, we always took it upon ourselves to recrystallize our palladium acetate or prepare it uh, fresh. Mm. And I would probably be more inclined to just dump it into the reaction from the bottle and assume it's pure. And if my reaction yeah. didn't work, then I would have wasted, you know, potentially six hours to an entire day. <laughs> Right. Uh, mm. Distillation of solvent, distillation of reagents, right, can be yep. incredibly important. And I, w I was too, putting a, putting a positive spin on it, I was too eager to see what the result would be. But more realistically, I wasn't patient enough and careful. Right. Those are, those are excellent points to bring up uh, because I even find that within myself. I mean, I use greener or butyl or, you know, lithium reagents all the time. And uh, like just taking the time to do a no DNMR to see what's in there and see what the actual concentration is, well, it will save you so much time. Yeah. And I'll even admit, like sometimes I, I have to, sometimes I have to just swallow my ego, like swallow your ego and just that, like, just, just do it. And then, yeah, things like, uh, you know, really making sure, you know, your solvents are, are distilled properly and dried, you know, and there's no, there's no dissolved oxygen, right? Especially if you're an organometallic chemist, like really doing your freeze pump thaws. Mm -hmm. are extremely important. And the earlier you do that in your, your, your graduate career, you know, the more success you'll have. It's just, I think it's, I think it's put simply. So yeah, those are, those are some great points. Um, but, you know, coming towards, um, the, the, your, the, your thesis, um, you know, what were kind of maybe some of like some key takeaways, um, from kind of like your, your thesis or the project that you had worked on over, you know, five years or so. 
Oh, uh, maybe could you could you clarify the question? Yeah. So, like, I, I don't know. Like, um, so when you're like, were there during your time at, at Scripps? Like, were there kind of like key takeaways from your thesis? Where like they were like that's a, of of interest. Like, if I had you know read your thesis, like, what's kind of the what are some of the main key takeaways? Um, whether that's a particular reaction or maybe that's, you know, I don't know if you guys did any like, bi like pharmacological studies on these compounds, but you know, um, what were, what were some of the, the key takeaways you think? It doesn't have to be about the chemistry itself, but maybe like, uh, um, you know, lessons learned practically, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. Yeah. So I would say there are, uh, some, some, some pretty esoteric lessons, and mm. it's not, I, I don't mean to criticize the work at all, but uh, I don't know how much uh, detail you want to go into. Uh, in the in my first half of my thesis, I worked on a natural product called Chartelline C. Mm -hmm. And the solution we came up with to synthesize that involved this key, what we think of um, potentially a biomimetic rearrangement. That is, we think that uh, when this compound is biosynthesized, okay. a similar sequence of reaction occurs. Uh, so we were able to then, uh, reduce this to practice in the reaction flask and it then led to natural product. We really don't know why this particular molecule is biosynthesized at all. Hmm. So it comes from a marine sponge. Oftentimes it's actually not the sponge that's a producer organism, but rather it's, um, microorganisms like either fungi or bacteria that are living in symbiosis with the sponge that are actually producing the small molecule that then is isolated when the sponge is collected. And um, so I so I guess you could say that the synthesis would and then enable the biology to be explored. In reality, that hasn't taken place. And I, I'm going to come back to this point because it's kind of led to our own my own lab's research philosophy. Um, and then the other second, the second project that I worked on in my PhD was a molecule that had actually a very important biological activity. It's called cortostatin A, and it inhibited the, the growth of HUVEX. I haven't, well, I haven't thought about this in years. It's human umbilical vein endothelial cells. So this is a model bioassay for angiogenesis. That is the growth of new blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually some of the most important Important work in this area was done subsequently by Matt Scher and Novartis, where they determined the mechanism of action for this inhibition of angiogenesis. But um, you may be familiar with that as a, a possible strategy for treating solid tumors. That mm. is, if you deprive the tumors of nutrients by inhibiting the growth of blood vessels, then the tumor will necrose and eventually die. Yeah. Um, so, so that was had potential, potentially very important biological activity. But those two projects never really made the transition from the basic science of chemistry and synthesis into translation to biomedicine. And so I would say that for me, the main take home message was that these are all great tools for procuring molecules that are otherwise very difficult to access. But to really take the next step and study them, you have to do that yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's this, there's this, there has been this view in the community that if you came up with this, if you come up with this great synthesis, then some lab that's interested in the function will reproduce the synthesis and then explore the function. And just practically, that's too difficult. It's not as though theoretically that's not possible, right. but to have a laboratory reproduce an existing total synthesis and all of the difficult techniques and reactions that occur in that process and then study the mechanism has just not proven realistic. Now that right. may change over time, especially as bioast has become more widespread and the burden of syntheses decreases, mm -hmm. but it just, it hasn't materialized. So right. the take home message for me from my thesis is part, partly comes from that experience, but it partly comes from my colleague, Dale Boger in the chemistry department, who I think just in passing in conversation one day said, if you don't study the biology, no one will. Mm. And it was um, a memorable, it was a memorable phrase and one that has stuck with me and guided our research. Right. I was going to say, it sounds exactly what you guys kind of do now. Um, I should have asked this earlier. Uh, do you have like any time constraints at all? Because I, I, we kind of, 
I, had, I was having fun. I was, <laughs> I was getting, we were having fun. I got carried away. I didn't really ask this. So yeah, actually uh, my, my schedule is fairly free today. I mean, I, I okay. see emails piling up and I have my own writing projects to complete, but okay. Uh, I don't want to hold there's no, there's no imminent. Uh, okay. Ending time. Okay. Cause I know we're, we're pushing on like one hour here and I, we haven't even touched on like your research yet. So I was like, Oh God, <laughs> no, sometimes that happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but so I guess the one last thing I want to say is, um, um, well, switching over to your, your, your postdoc now, um, one thing I have about that is, you know, was it kind of a natural decision for you to go do postdoctoral research? Um, you know, how did that kind of decisions transpire, whether that was because, you know, industry or, you know, maybe it wasn't the job market wasn't right yet, or what kind of, what kind of led that to go do a postdoctoral research? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, early on, I had been interested potentially in going into academia mm -hmm. and that was partly because you know, I think um, seeing seeing Ray uh, lead his research group and teach was really inspiring. Uh, and then you know, Phil's very um, profound and early success in academia made it look so easy. You know, uh, spoiler alert, it's not. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's really hard. But it feels so good. He made it look easy. Uh, Ray, too. Uh, and then also the graduate students in Ray's lab really encouraged me to think about it because, you know, I just, I, I, I had so many questions for them. I was so curious about organic chemistry uh, and they just thought, you know, l listen, this curiosity seems like it's right for academia where you can just kind of follow your instincts. And if you're curious about something, you can answer that question mm -hmm. with a little more freedom than you can in industry. It's not, it's not impossible in industry by any means, sure. but that's not, that's not why you're there in many ways in academia you're in academia to follow your curiosity and answer these fundamental questions. Yeah. So when I applied to graduate school, I actually did want to work for Corey and I only found out uh, kind of late, I'm not sure when, late in the application process that he was no longer taking graduate students. At the time yep. he was already um, partially retired. He still had a group, I think his final graduate students maybe were still graduating, but he was only accepting postdocs. Mm -hmm. So you know, that, that was kind of disappointing. But when I found out that Phil had done a postdoc with Corey and I was so curious about what it was like to be in that group, I, you know, he told me that, well, since he is taking postdocs, maybe you could set that as a good goal to have for your PhD mm -hmm. and you could head to Corey uh, after you're finished here. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really cool. I was, I was like, I was curious to see uh, how old EJ Corey is. He's like 95 now. So, um, yeah, still yeah, going strong. He's still going yeah. strong. I, it, um, Professor Olaf Douglas made a funny joke. He's like, for whatever reason, chemists, we're always inhaling like in chemicals, like or what, volatile chemicals, whatever, but we just seem to be living the longest. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> something about something about professors born in like, you know, before, like I should say when they were like uh, it, born in like the 1930s or 40s or whatever, kind of like smoking cigarettes in the lab and stuff like that. So cigars, cigar is like something like. They're still kick, they're still going strong today, and they're still as mentally some of them are, a lot of them are still as mentally sharp as ever, um, which is yeah. really interesting yeah. to see. Um, but so yeah, so you, so you did some postdoctoral research with uh, Professor E.J. Corey. Um, wait, is this MIT or Harvard? I forget. He was uh, at Harvard. Harvard, yeah. okay. Um, so he went over to Harvard, uh, back over to the to the Northeast, and uh, you know what were you know. What were your projects as a um, postdoctoral researcher? What were you interested in, in solving? Yeah, so um, my first project after, you know, it actually took some time to find an, a, what Professor Corey and I agreed on would be an appropriate project. It is mm. difficult when you're a postdoc because it feels so long. I mean, it's like a two year, potentially three year period. But in fact, that goes by so fast, you know, right. people say graduate school itself goes by fast, but that's, you know, four to five years. Postdoc is very short. And oftentimes in chemistry, uh, you're applying for jobs after one year. Yeah. So you've got to find a project that feasibly you could either make progress on or complete after one year. Now, that that has changed over time as um, I think the scope of a postdoc has expanded a little bit, but it still is short. And I ended up picking up a project uh, as another natural. Well, okay, this is complicated. So it started out actually <laughs> as a methodology project that grew out of a problem that came from the synthesis of a small molecule called amurolide. Okay. And amurolide is a really interesting strained beta lactone 
that inhibits uh, the human proteasome. And that itself is, has been a successful strategy in cancer therapeutics. There's a small molecule called bortezomib that has the same mechanism of action. And Corey had identified a, an asymmetric formaldehyde aldol reaction as potentially a very useful transformation in this synthesis. But it was very challenging because in a reversible aldol reaction, the rate determining step turns out to be the carbon-carbon bond formation, mm -hmm. where the enolate attacks the carbonyl. But in a formaldehyde aldol, because of the very high reactivity of formaldehyde, the rate determining step actually turns out to be the deprotonation step, formation of the enol or the enolate. Mm. Uh, and that then makes control of stereochemistry very challenging. So I started on this project and I was not making very good progress. And I decided that if I really wanted to see this to completion in a short time period, I kind of had to rejigger the way we were thinking about how to advance a project. So uh, I ended up coming up with a, a different way of thinking about control of stereochemistry in the synthesis, and that ended up uh, then being successful. And the important thing for me was that what I was making actually was not omuralide. Omuralide was the natural product that was isolated many years ago. Um, but what I was making was an analog that the Cori lab had identified in the 1990s as being equally as active as omuralide, but simpler. Mm. And that has significantly inspired my own research and my, in my current group. Right. Yeah. I, I was going to say that it like, uh, kind of, uh, reducing the, the complexity of these molecules sometimes can be, well, is the, is the key to a lot of these, uh, let's say biological assays really, I, I would argue, um, not having... yeah. So, so the, the, the key nuance here, and I, I think it's hard sometimes to wrap your mind around is that there's not a clear correspondence between the synthetic difficulty and the structural complexity. Right. So in my postdoctoral work, the, the structural complexity was decreased and that happened to decrease the synthetic burden or the synthetic complexity, you'd say. But that's not always true. And so what my lab is working on now within the realm of natural products is how to either maintain or potentially even increase structural complexity in a way that decreases the synthetic burden. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you start decreasing synthetic, uh, excuse me, as soon as you start decreasing structural complexity, you start removing all the elements of the structure that, different, that differentiate natural products from feedstock compounds or drugs, as you mentioned right. in, you know, when you were chatting in the beginning. Yeah. So, uh, this, uh, this is a great... Uh... A transition then into your, your research now. Um, so you, you accepted the position at back to scripts, going back to scripts. Uh, I, I guess out of curiosity, I mean, was it, was that kind of a weird feeling kind of going back to scripts for your professorship or is that kind of like a, I mean, it, or just kind of, did it, I mean, it just kind of happened like that. I assume like the professorship just kind of opened and then you applied to it, but I'm not really sure, um, you know, how the opportunity arose. Yeah. I wasn't actually in planning originally, a, 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 I wasn't planning to apply to Scripps. Uh, I didn't know that they were going to have an opening. And I think it appeared kind of late that year. And it was actually the only school west of the Mississippi that I applied to because I, oh, my wow. wife and I kind of were thinking about staying on the East Coast. But when the opportunity arose and I was offered a position, it was kind of a, an offer I couldn't refuse because I had such a great time here as a graduate student. Just the idea yeah. of coming back was uh, hard to decline. And in many That's ways, really cool. I mean, it's it felt in some ways like coming home just because I yep. was so familiar with the uh, people and the building, but it sure. was a little weird because I was still overlapping with uh, students who were graduate students when I was a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> postdoc in chemistry is often only two years. Yeah. And um, yeah, that, so that was a kind of a strange dynamic to it's navigate. A unique feeling for sure. Um, yeah. But, you know, coming to your research now, I mean, it's, I, it's a, I don't, maybe you could do a better job of kind of summarizing it. I mean, obviously you guys do natural product synthesis, but it's, it's much more than that. Um, you know, it's really like, like you mentioned, like really trying to find maybe the minimal structural complexity, like, so that it's synthetically feasible, but also really maintaining the biological activity. 
and that you know and for a lot of these for a lot of compounds you know those really differ um uh, and you know each each compound or each class of molecules really it, the variety of that or whatever wherever you lie on that spectrum is extremely different so there's huge there's always more work to be done in this area and so how did you kind of approach this type of problem um so i as you mentioned i guess you kind of found this during your postdoctoral experience but then how did you begin to think about applying this into your like own research lab like wh where did you begin with this kind of idea yeah so, so yeah so, so sometimes um chemistry is referred to as the central science or the universal science because in some ways it, it, it is like a hub for interfacing with many different fields, mm -hmm. right? It's almost all areas of science somehow go through chemistry because we deal with matter and transformations of matter. So it's, it's hard to avoid in physics. It's hard to avoid in biology. It's impossible to avoid in biology yes. and medicine. Uh, and natural products in many ways are sort of a central hub within that hub because they're um, unavoidably biological. I mean, the fact that they're natural products signals that they are made through biological, biosynthetic pathways, and they serve some function. That doesn't mean that function will be of any utility to medicine. It's of utility to the producer <laughs> organism to help them thrive in their ecological niche. But when you start with a natural product and you want to synthesize it, you know, obviously there's an end goal that somehow reaches into biology or medicine. And then on the other side, there is the approach of synthesizing it to then change its structure or interrogate its function. And in the process of synthesizing it, you often find these technological gaps that may inspire new chemical reactions where, you know, you want to build this bond the current technology doesn't work, so you have to come up with a different method to solve it. And then if you do come up with a different method to solve it, well, then you may be curious about well, what is the mechanism that allows that particular reaction to work, whereas the others failed. And so mm. you start with a natural product and you go into translation to biology, mechanism of action, but then backwards into methodology and into mechanism. And it just you know blossoms from there. Mm. So one of the things that... Um, caught my attention early on in thinking about the universality of natural products is that it's not really necessarily the specific natural product that inspires all of these innovations. It's rather the features of the molecule that are like lots of other natural products. You could say it's its location in chemical space. Mm. So, you know, for example, you can, you can delete a methyl group or add a methyl group like I did during my postdoctoral work based on uh, the SAR from the Cori lab. And just looking at that structure, you may not be able to determine whether that's a natural product or not. It's an analog of the natural product. So it has all the features of the natural product and, and all these features are the things that stimulate methodology and may not impact biology appreciably. Hmm. So I think there's, there's sort of this rigid dogma in traditional natural product synthesis that I mentioned in the beginning, which is that this target is your goal, this natural product, you reach that and you're done. And I think there's actually great benefit from going outside of that dogma and being more flexible about what we consider targets still within natural product synthesis, but that may not be themselves natural products. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to maybe put you on spot a little bit here, but is, is there maybe an example of two of like kind of practicing this like re whether that's recently or maybe older, like, do you have like a kind of a story or two, some of your favorites that kind of yeah, really yeah, illustrate sure. this idea? Yeah. The one that's probably best known for my lab is um, centered on a molecule called salvinorin A. Okay. So many people may be familiar with this because it's a metabolite of the plant uh, salvia divinorum, which has arisen through the cultivation of the Mazatec people over centuries, actually, who have been kind of uh, caretakers of this plant. Some people think of it it's a cultivar, that is, it's not a naturally occurring uh, species, but rather as one that's been differentiated over time due to cultivation by humans. And uh, this small molecule is pretty well known because it's used in both medicine, but also ritual by the Mazatec people to induce mild auditory and visual hallucinations. Mm. But it turns out that if you uh, smoke it and you get a much larger amount of uh, more quickly to the brain, it causes very intense hallucination. And 
as a result, has become a recreational drug in Western countries. In fact, it's, I think it's banned in 33 countries because uh, when you uh, hallucinate, you kind of lose consciousness of your surroundings. And you can then, you know, I think I, so, some person end up throwing themselves out a window. You can imagine oh, doing great harm to yourself as a result of um, using this. But there's also potentially great therapeutic benefit because it was determined that it targets the kappa opioid receptor. And this has been a, a target under investigation for next generation pain therapeutics that get away from things like morphine and fentanyl, which obviously we have a vested interest in doing. So um, just really quickly, just really quickly on this, maybe for yeah. so, so for some viewers. So salvinor A, yeah. I was like looking up the structure of it. It's a terpeno, it's a steroid. Um, or I don't know if well, steroid, it's maybe not, that's it's not a steroid, it's but steroid. you could say Terpenoid. it's related to steroids. It's really... But I guess, I guess what's interesting about it is because it is psychotropic, so it has the like the biological properties like like a DMT or psilocybin, but it's structurally not even close. Um, particularly because it doesn't have any nitrogens in it, which is interesting. I'm looking at the structure now. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So, so one of the one of the oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, one of the one of the hallmarks of organic synthesis is like you know, every for every nitrogen you add a year onto your PhD, it's, it's just nitrogens are extremely difficult. Um, let's say to deal with in, in natural processes, but salvinor A doesn't have any nitrogens. So while it's very psychotropic and also structurally very different from like DNT and psilocybin, you still get a lot of like hallucinogenic um, properties, which is, so it's very, it's very distinct just for those reasons alone. So that's all I really wanted to say about that. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I have to be cautious about saying that it's similar to psilocybin or DMT. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in pharmacologically, it's extremely different. So structurally, okay. it's different. Also, uh, the only overlap it has is that it is psychotropic, but the mechanism yeah. of action is very different. And very different. The yeah, debate yeah. right now is whether it has the same therapeutic potential as something like psilocybin. Okay, that's a very, um, so that's a very good point to yeah bring that up. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah, and and with respect to the absence of a nitrogen, yeah, that's very unusual. I would say people who say that a nitrogen adds all these years <laughs> onto your PhD, uh, it's it, it's that's more to sell your research, <laughs> show yeah. how difficult your molecule is. That's not always true. <laughs> um, Salvinor and A is itself, even though it lacks in nitrogen, very difficult. But one of the um, one of the interesting things about Salvinor and A is that it binds with such high affinity to the kappa opioid receptor. And before it was isolated, it was thought that in order to have high affinity, you have to have a Lewis basic nitrogen that will form a salt bridge to a conserved acidic residue within the binding pocket. Okay. Salvinor and A kind of blew that paradigm. Um, so what, what we, we kind of, um, coming out of this, coming out of this thought process about the importance of natural product space, but not necessarily the natural product itself. We were thinking along those lines at the time, I mean, I'd even wrote, written a grant on an antibiotic class called mutilins, you know, with that perspective in mind, wasn't funded by the way. I mean, it, preliminary data does, does actually matter. And we were able to you know, reduce this idea to practice with salvinor and A by deleting one of its angular methyl groups. It's sort of right in the middle of the structure. And it both causes, you know, problems in the synthesis for um, uh, very clear reasons. It's in our paper, if you're curious, you can read about it. But it's a key, key, key bond formation that you'd want to break, but it becomes very challenging with that methyl group in place. But that methyl group, it turns out, also destabilizes the structure. Mm. So salvinor and A, when you try to do medicinal chemistry on it to modify it, will epimerize when it epimerizes and changes the configuration of a central carbon atom, it ends up losing a significant amount of potency, but it's also very difficult to separate those diastereomers from one another, which right. then makes interrogation of the pharmacology and SAR very challenging. Okay. So in, in our study, we showed that we could both delete this methyl and then in a subsequent paper change an oxygen to a carbon and those both have significant consequences for the synthesis but it turns out don't really change the biology and as a result we could use that now unnatural scaffold which by the way is also outside of patentable ip space or, or previously patented ip space and then start modifying other areas of a structure and start exceeding now many of the properties of self and rna itself Okay. So we, we've had a few papers in this area, and that's probably the case study that people know the most. We have another paper in Root where we do the same thing on a molecule called picrotoxinin, which is toxic to humans and also to insects, 
And in this class, we reduce the potency against human receptors, but increase the potency against insect receptors. Interesting. I guess a question I have about this then is how do you kind of decide like what products to target? I mean, obviously there's infinite numbers of like natural products you could consider and quadruple or, you know, 10, 10 like exponential, like the number of analogs you can make. So, you know, how do you kind of select what products you guys want to target? And then, you know, how do you, yeah. So how, like, how do you decide on these, these kind of things? Yeah, that is a, that is a, well, maybe unbeknownst to you, that's a loaded question because I am so slow in project selection. My students will probably tell you that is an understatement. I am maybe <laughs> overly cautious about project selection because I know that it's a huge investment of time. Things almost never right. work out exactly as we planned. And then of course, after we've completed the target, we do want to have action items ahead of us that we can then um, start addressing through our synthesis that are unique to our synthesis and is not possible with semi-synthesis. Mm. So there are all of these filters that you have to apply. The good thing is there's so many fascinating natural products out there that even if you have many filters, you have such a huge starting point that you narrow down to then just a few. Um, but, it, but it is challenging. And I don't know if I have um, any good advice. And in fact, if I had fewer filters, it'd make my life a lot easier. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, I guess, and then the other question I had about kind of how you think about, um, let's say biological assays of the, let's say the analogs, right? So um, how does that kind of work practically? I mean, so maybe you conduct a few steps and then do you take, you have enough sample to kind of run the biological assays and you, you just kind of like each step along the way, you're kind of comparing the biological activities of whatever the, the, the target is, or like, how does that kind of work practically in your lab? Like, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We have had some projects where as the synthesis has progressed, we've gone through and tested some of the small molecules to see if they recapitulate the same activity as the natural product. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, we try to get ahead of the biological assay at the beginning to find out, okay, are there people either at scripts or uh, at institutions that we could easily send material to uh, who will who will be able to or be or be interested in assaying these small molecules when we finish? Number one. Number two. We try to never design a synthesis where there's even a question about will we have enough at the end to biologically characterize. We almost, in many ways, don't care about characterizing the natural product itself. At least mm -hmm. that's not our end goal. What we really want to do is surpass the properties of the natural product. So if you're in a spot where you're not even sure you're going to have enough to assay, your synthesis probably isn't very good. And we, we, we are more interested in making so much that we can diversify and explore. And then the other thing is that in now in the modern age of both the internet, extensive worldwide shipping and the biotechnology boom, there's so many companies out there that have the assay that you want to run. So independent of whether someone at Scripps or a, another academic institution has the assay, we could always just outsource it to an assay service company. And I think that that is a major yep. change uh, over the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, I, I guess another area of your, of re of your research that I, I, I find really interesting is kind of functionalization, I would say of olefin. So, I mean, you know, you can mm -hmm. kind of do, and you know, you can kind of do this through a, you know, one electron or two electron process, but generally speaking, you know, you have a lot of work in uh, using things like iron and nickel manganese to make quaternary centers. Uh, starting with an olefin, uh, but also, you know, hydride additions. Um, so I, I don't know how easy it is to maybe summarize this project or maybe at least like summarize more of the recent, more recent projects. Um, but uh, yeah, so like making their, like making quaternary centers of uh, starting with like olefins, like how did, how, you know, where have you kind of been with this, this project or this area of research in your lab? Yeah, that's a big question. That's a whole nother podcast. I don't know how much time we have to talk about this. Because it's a, it's I have as much time as you'd like to. Right, keep going. <laughs> hey. uh, this, this, is a, this is a topic that has sort of come and gone over the years, but recently we have a, we've, we've had, we had a paper over the summer and we have a few more in the pipeline uh, where we are able to extend the work that we've done in a surprising new direction. Hmm. So I, I would say that, kind of try to summarize this area 
if you look at a lot of the metal catalysis that's used for alkene functionalization in the literature, generally it goes through a coordinative process. Okay, so you have your, here's, here's your double bond, excuse my fingers, okay. Here's your metal, uh, the metal then complexes to the double bond uh, through the pi system, through the, through the, uh, the pi cloud. Yep. And so this is the sort of a staple of the hectite mechanisms or Vockertite mechanisms. But, but in natural product synthesis, it's, it seldom works or it seldom works the first time. And it's extremely constrained when it comes to uh, steric repulsion of the surrounding functionality because this double bond is never existing in isolation. It has substituents on it. And even independent of the substitution pattern, it has other groups surrounding it that could obstruct coordination of the metal center to the double bond. And as you know, from your organometallic and inorganic background, that's a very weak interaction. Yeah. It's not like an alkyne bonding to a metal very strongly, but rather it's a weak interaction. So, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've tried to apply, let's say palladium catalysis, double bond functionalization and an yeah. after product synthesis and to no avail. So what we have been looking at is a reaction where the double bond is reacting with the metal, but not at the metal center, but at a ligand. Mm. And as a result, um, there's less steric clash involved in the interaction in the elementary step. These tend, uh, and this kind of comes from Pat Holland's work, they tend to have extremely low energy barriers. Yeah. Okay. Independent of actually the rest of the functionality, uh, the, the, the actual reaction rate constant seems to be extremely high and therefore the rate very, very high. Um, and then the other thing is that because it doesn't rely on coordination of a very weak Lewis base to a reasonably weak Lewis acid, you don't get competition from other Lewis basic functionality like solvent. Mm. So all your Lewis basic solvent that can compete with your olefin or alcohols or amides. And even some cases, tertiary amines, which are so strongly Lewis basic actually don't inhibit the catalysis. So this has been from our perspective, from natural product synthesis, a real boon for using alkenes as um, connection points for making difficult bonds. Yeah, that, that, that is an excellent point. Cause uh, yeah, I would say the way it's described in like organometallic chemistry, olefins are great. Obviously they are great synthetic handles, uh, but these are kind of, only in like let's say a 2d dimensional space is this kind of like really useful and then as soon as you begin to have like three dimension three dimensionality um and like you said like more lewis basic um uh functional groups which is definitely prominent in natural products this type of thinking of of metal catalysis just is extremely difficult and so shifting the paradigm to I wouldn't say outer sphere. I, I guess outer sphere is not really the right word, but a well, from middle so center. No, 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 no. You're right. It, it is. So this is this is complicated, and I'm a big stickler for using the right terminology because I feel like uh, otherwise yeah. it can mislead the reader or the listener to the wrong place. Yeah. So outer sphere is not a as common when it when you apply it to organometallic mechanisms. Um, so, so let, let me for for the benefit of your readers who are deeply in chemistry, usually inner and outer sphere is applied to single electron transfer reactions, mm -hmm. okay, where you're either um, forming a bond and the electron transfers that's interfere, or you don't have to form a bond between your donor and the acceptor, and you simply have a collision-based uh, transfer of the electron. However, in organometallics chemistry, somehow inner and out, uh, occasionally inner and outer sphere refers to whether the substrate binds to the metal center and therefore forms a new complex, and therefore the substrate becomes part of the ligand sphere of the metal, or it does not form a bond to the metal center, and therefore reacts, let's say, with the ligand, as I just described, to yeah. form a new bond. I was just going through your publications to kind of like see this in action, and I'm looking at this right now. So the your iron catalyzed hydrobenzylation to do mm -hmm. was a natural was this eugenial eugenial C, I yeah. think. Yeah. And I'm looking at this right now. So like you, you were able to do a in, intramolecular ra like radical addition to another fragment. I mean, that just seems so bizarre. <laughs> if I'm looking at this, like um, they do radical chemistry yeah, would, intramolecularly. That seems crazy. Um, I was really happy that 
so this, this is sort of, um, we put this in review actually. So this is sort of a key disconnection that we identified that should be feasible based on the chemistry that we had been developing. Mm -hmm. But this is one of these things where as a PI, you have to be careful with your words. You don't want to tell the graduate student working on it that you're skeptical that it will ever be successful. But <laughs> many times I felt that way because it is such a old and unusual disconnection that I thought, you know, maybe we'll learn something and e we'll maybe never be able to form this bond, but maybe we'll be able to redirect the efforts for something, yeah. something else as a target. Uh, but yeah, Simona was fantastic. She was persistent and she was able to get this to work. And uh, I've, I, I'm shocked. It's my, one of my favorite graphical abstracts because it's such a surprising bond. Yeah, that it's is so subtle. That is so crazy. I mean, you're forming a quaternary center intramolecularly with two more or less giant pieces. Like that is, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I would say maybe, I guess what's unique about it is like conventional thinking would, couldn't really get you there. But I think we're, especially nowadays with like people using iron as kind of like a radical um, uh, metal. I mean, you really, maybe we really can start to think about disconnections in a really abstract way. So that's really cool. Um, yeah. And I have to be, I do have to be clear that, um, you know, this bond disconnection came from chemistry that we had been developing. So we, we had like a mm. pretty long runway getting up to this point. The breakthrough actually came, uh, from reading a paper from Dave McMillan's lab in 2021 okay. and adapting his chemistry to suit this problem. So I always want to give credit where credit is due. And that really arose out of adapting his catalytic system to our problem. Mm. That's all. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, to do that. Um, so Professor Shenvey, I want, I want to thank you so much for coming on to the, the podcast today. It was super yeah, it was uh, pleasure. pleasant talking with you and uh, hearing about your chemistry and all your experiences as well. Um, super fun today. And hopefully, uh, you know, the, the listeners at home, I mean, hopefully if anything else, they learned something today and, you know, we'll check out your work. Um, so yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, fantastic. And Aiden, next time we talk, I want to hear about your chemistry because I'm a big I, fan of the Carol. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, hopefully we definitely have some good things coming on the, the horizon. So, um, uh, yeah, or my can't exam is over. So, you know, the, the, um, the, I won't say the pressure cause I really enjoy what I do, but like now it's like, I have basically no more milestones until like the dissertation. So I'm really looking forward to oh, it. Next, that's a great feeling. You know? Yeah. Congratulations on passing your candidacy. That's Thank great. you. So uh, I'm really looking forward. We have some good work coming out and uh, yeah, the, the polarizability stuff is, it, it's looking really exciting right now. Um, especially making these synthetic ligands, I would say making these ligands synthetically, not just putting them on the computer. Like it's really exciting right now. Yeah. But, yeah. But I'm looking back home. forward to it. Yeah. So well, thank you again for another episode and uh, you know, we'll see you on the next one. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care.